lesson. I'm, I'm so honored and, and grateful to be able to, to present this lesson. Thank you for the invitation, elders. And um, I hope that you don't really strongly dislike maps or geography. If you do, <laughs> you, you may just want to do something else. But I, I uh, and I also appreciate Ron. I, I gave him the difficult task of an impossible topic to find songs with, and he did it. So I, I appreciate that. So uh, obviously, the intent of this lesson is not to be academic. Um, the Bible's not a geography textbook, um, but it's a book filled with geography. And the Holy Spirit could have chosen to have the authors not mention a single place name, a single location, a single geographic feature. But what you find throughout the Bible, both in the Old and New Testament, is just the opposite. To the degree that we miss or misunderstand the geography, or not understand really the nature of the geography that's referred to in the text, we oftentimes can misunderstand a part of the text itself. So there's five reasons why I want to share with you why we should maybe pay more attention to the geography. I think that for me personally, having these names and these places tethers the spiritual to the physical. And it helps us to understand that we're not reading about fairy tales and mythological stories. We're not, we're not getting stories that were made up. The foundation of these narratives that we read in the Old and New Testament are based upon fact, reality, and geography. And in many cases, the geography is vitally important to understand the text. So uh, I'd like to, over the just next few minutes, give you a highlight. I'm going to show you lots of pictures, many of which, I'm sorry, Carol, I'm going to try to describe them the best I can. I thought of you when I put this together. Um, but but uh, a, a lot of pictures and images, not with the intent of analyzing them very closely, because we'd be here all night, uh, but to just give you uh, a snapshot of what we're talking about. This image here, of course, is Israel um, that in, is inclusive, of course, of many of the nations that surround Israel. And, and, and it's very important that we understand where Edom is and where Moab is because these, these names, these places are referred to in the Minor Prophets and elsewhere. Uh, Moab is going to be a very important place because someone from Moab is going to be in the, li in the line of David. And so uh, when, we, when we gloss by these passages with Naomi and Ruth leaving from Moab to go to Bethlehem, we can gloss over that, not realizing where this is and what's going on. And so here's Moab, and Bethlehem is, they would have had to go all the way around the Dead Sea, uh, across the River Jordan, and into Bethlehem. So again, it's a, it's a big picture. But we also, of course, have... Uh, we, we referred to Israel as being from Dan to Beersheba. Dan is way up in the north, which is right next to near Lebanon today. And Beersheba is all the way, all the way down here uh, that we'll see just, uh, uh, just about an hour and a half south of Jerusalem. So when we talk about Abraham, and we thank you for the reading with respect to Abraham going into Egypt. Why did he go into Egypt? And why does it give us this very specific reference? Because Abraham's going to go into Egypt sojourning there, and of course, his family is going to go into Egypt for safety and protection. God is going to lead them to safety, and he's going to lead them out of Egypt in a picture very similar to our redemption in the New Testament. He's going to paint this picture for us coming out of slavery into the promised land. To Canaan's land, I'm on my way, should, should resonate with us because it's an image and picture of God's people being rescued out of slavery, out of a physical place. It's a place that we're going to be in May. It's a place that we, we visit. Uh, and when we go to Egypt down here, we, we go to the sites, we go near where Goshen was. And we can see with our eyes, likely the area, the palace area, where Pharaoh's, uh, Pharaoh's daughter reaches down out of the river and pulls Moses out of. So these are real places, real events, and they're meaningful to us because they translate into our understanding of the New Testament, especially when it comes to our redemption. So look at, the, look at where Abraham went. He starts in Ur, which is in modern-day Babylon. 
you can't go, you know, why is it that he goes up to Haran? And of course, this is where Jacob's going to find his wife and Isaac's going to find his wife. Why go all the way up there and not just straight across? Because there's a desert there. You can't cross the desert. So when the children of Israel were taken into captivity in 586 B.C., did they go straight across? Nope, they went all the way up north, up to probably where Haran is, and down the Euphrates and Tigris River. This is the Euphrates, and this is the Tigris River. And they, they had to go all the way up, and then all the way back down. When Zerubbabel and Ezra and Nehemiah lead the children of Israel back from captivity, guess where they went? They went all the way up and all the way down. Folks, it would have taken several months, three to four months, to go from this area or from Babylon up and down. So again, we get an idea of what's going on here. So geography number one reminds us that God has always been at work in the physical world. And he's still at work in the physical world. And so when we read Genesis and we see our maps in the Bible, and maybe you, maybe you have them in the back of your Bible, maybe you have them on your iPad or whatever it may be, we see these specific places like, for instance, with Jacob, he, he's going to go to Bethel. And he's going to name that site Bethel, which means the house of God. And then he's going to go up, of course, all the way up to Haran. He's going to come back down. He's going to wrestle with God. And he's going to name that place Peniel, which means I came face to face with God. So these places are real. Uh, and Jacob names these places after God's providence is demonstrated at these sites. So God's revelation isn't abstract, and it's not just purely spiritual. It's rooted in significant geographical locations. And so what does that mean for us today? I mean, God cares about where you live. God cares about the names of cities and places, just like he did back then. And so where are these places? They're places that you can go to. It's places that we've been. Um, here's Beersheba. Bethel is just a few miles north of Jerusalem. And so one of the things when you think about the division of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, you think there's miles and huge gap between the north southern kingdom of Judah and the ten tribes of, of, Judah, uh, ten, ten tribes of Israel in the north. No. One of the capital cities of the northern tribe is Bethel, which is literally, you can see it from Jerusalem. That's how close these places were. So Bethel, and then all the way up here, look how far Haran is. And then you can see the side of Peniel uh, up in the Jacob River here. Of course, he's going to come down. Um, and so you can see Peniel here. This is the site. It's on, the, it's on, of course, the eastern side of the Jordan River. But these places exist, and these places, of course, are real. So geography is important. And since Genesis, God has been weaving himself into history in the terrain of, of Israel and of these other places. And so the study of geography, of course, is important. And I, I think that it's helpful to, to, there's this false division or false dichotomy between physical and the spiritual world. Um, and I think that when God stepped into our world and he still works in our world, I think it's very important for us to understand that. So we got to hurry quickly, but I want to just, th these are kind of the nations of the Bible. Um, and again, they're all in this kind of this area here. Um, and and between, between Africa and between Asia Minor is this land bridge. And the land bridge between these two massive continents is Israel. So throughout history, Israel has remained a vitally important piece of land that connects Africa, especially the nation of Israel and the Hittite nation, uh, the, the, and of course, the nations that would form, including Rome and other nations, Asia Minor, the Hittites, and many others. This strip of land, this is Canaan right here. Jerusalem, again, its later capital. Syria, of course, modern day Syria is there now, uh, but look all the way down here in the Persian, the Persian Gulf, in modern day Iran. This is the, the birth of the, of the, of the um, uh, Persian Empire with Esther and Darius and Daniel. Remember that in captivity, the children of Israel will be taken from Canaan up and down the Euphrates, and they'll be taken to Babylon, 
And then Babylon would be taken over by the Persians, Cyrus. And, um, and, and of course, they would create a capital in Susa. So if you ask yourself, where did the events of Esther and Xerxes take place, or Hasras? Uh, it's not in Babylon, it's in Susa. And when you go to Iran today, and I've, I've, I've looked for tours there, but my wife has discouraged me from going there. I don't know why. <laughs> I really would like to visit this place, but it is in modern-day Iran. But Susa, you can see the remains of Susa today, and you can see exactly where the palace was, where likely the events of Esther took place. It's really fascinating. So, number two, geography helps us to meet biblical characters as real humans and not as fictitious characters. It takes seriously, it helps us to take seriously our own embodiment. And I gave us an example just a few minutes ago of, of Ruth and Naomi's journey uh, from famine in Moab. What was going on in famine in Moab? There was famine there. And then where do, where do they go? They go to a place called Bethlehem, which means house of bread. I think that's by accident. House of bread. Um, and so what's interesting is, is that there's this man named Boaz that was going to marry Ruth. And uh, Boaz was the son of this couple named Salmon and Rahab. Rahab being from Jericho. Where's Jericho? Well, it's not that far from Bethlehem. Bethlehem's further up in the hill country. Jericho is really far down. It's almost 1,000 feet below sea level. Um, and so, again, we can, we can understand these characters better. We can understand their bitterness, their, their hunger, and especially cases like uh, Naomi, and, and Rahab, or Naomi and Ruth's sojourn, Abraham's sojourn in these people's uh, travels. So here's Moab. Here's, of course, the Dead Sea. And look where they had to travel. This is desert. This is, they're, 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 this is desert. It's rocks and dirt. And it was a long journey. Again, probably traveling the same route the Israelites did when they left Egypt. The same route, likely. They came up, they crossed the Jordan, uh, and then went over into Bethlehem, which is, again, like five miles away from Jerusalem. So again, you can see, again, this, uh, another, another image. Edom here um, in Moab. You see Ammon, uh, Moab and Ammon, of course, uh, the, the, the sons of the daughters of Lot. Um, and again, all of those events took place down here in, southern, in the southern part of, uh, of the Negev. And then, of course, we have Jerusalem and the hill country. So what do you have here right along this path between the Dead Sea? Here's Jericho right along this rift valley that goes all the way up to the Sea of Galilee. It is well below sea level. This is what's called the African Rift. It's very deep. The deepest place on earth, anybody know where it's at? It's the Dead Sea. It's over 1,300 feet below sea level. Um, and so guess where Jerusalem is? You can't really see on this map, but Jerusalem sits 1,300 feet above sea level. So if you're in Jericho and you're going to Jerusalem, what's the text going to indicate where you're going, up to Jerusalem. In almost every case, you'll see up to Jerusalem because you're going up physically, geographically, from typically a lower level to a higher level. And so that gives us some idea of what's going on there. Again, taking seriously the embodiment of, embodiment of the biblical characters is very important. It allows us to take seriously our own embodiment as well. And it gets important to remind ourselves that our bodies and our circumstances matter to God as they did back then. Number three, uh, reading geographically helps us engage with the text settings in active ways. So geography invites us to immerse ourselves in the world of the Bible, which is really helpful. And, and let me just say this and be very clear. You do not have to visit Israel for this to happen. You don't have to be there and walk in these roads and be in this area for this to happen, this can happen with just Bible study, having maps, doing a little digging. Um, so, again, you know, one of the things that you should ask yourself when you look at Bethlehem, when you look at Capernaum, major cities referred to in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, Gezer, Megiddo, you know, why are those cities so important? 
uh, well, it may be that they're important because they're along a particular way. So I want you to follow, right? Here's the Mediterranean Sea. Here's Israel. And there is a major pathway along the sea. It's called the Via Maris. It goes back thousands and thousands of years. And this pathway went, goes along. And look at the places that, you, that, are, that govern the road, that oversee the road. Right along this path, Gaza, Ashdod, Aphek. And then a major turning point is when you, when you stop going along the sea. Does anybody know what's right here that stops you from going just straight up the coast? It's a line of mountains. It's very important in the Old Testament. Anybody know? It's a ridge of mountains called the Carmel Mountains. So why can't you go straight up the coast? It's because you run into a ridge of mountains. And so you have to turn in, turn east, and the city that sits right on the Via Maris is Megiddo. Do you know where there's been more bloodshed and battles in all of history? It's in Megiddo. And it shouldn't surprise you, the book of Revelation is going to use that, that name when it refers to this day of judgment where there's going to be bloodshed, where there's going to be this great battle, and it's going to use the word our, our hill of Megiddo, or Armageddon in the book of Revelation. So understanding why Megiddo is important helps you understand why symbolically Megiddo is going to represent this last great final battle that's referred to in the book of Revelation. And then as you go up, you're going to see the Sea of Galilee, and there's another city right on the Sea of Galilee that, that there would most certainly be a tax collector there. There would be a very important administrative area there because it's right along the VMRS. That's the city of Capernaum. You also see these major trade routes. Uh, here along the Rift Valley, you can see straight up, you would be down very low, be very hot. This is right along the, the ridge, the hill country. This is called the, the Path of the Patriarchs because this is likely where Abraham and the patriarchs traveled right along the top of the hillside. Um, so here's Beersheba. Abraham is going to go to this place that he's told to go. He's told to go to this place. It's called the Land of Moriah. The Land of Moriah. So where is that? Well, he's going to go from here. He's going to go right to Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem, even though it wasn't named Jerusalem at that time, it was, the, it was known as the land of Moriah. Um, and, and so, again, that's Beersheba up right along this central ridge area where he would have traveled. So, again, it's important that we engage in geography in many ways. And, again, open your Bible maps and look. Um, this gives you kind of an idea of the topography. Look how deep the Dead Sea is. And then you have the, the major hill country right in the middle where Jerusalem sits, where Hebron sits, where Shiloh sits. Um, so you have this major hill area, and then it drops at Mount Geboa into this uh, very fertile area called the Jezreel Valley. And then you have another big ridge right here, right in front of the, the Jezreel Valley, that's the, the city that was on a ridge very high up in the air. I'll show you in a minute a city called Nazareth. Nazareth. So, um, I want to move quickly. Number four, learning geography shows us the scope of God's mission. So when you consider why Mark includes two stories about Jesus feeding a large crowd, sometimes we get confused and we think, well, he's just repeating the same story. No, there's two events that likely happen where he feeds a large group of people but when you're on the, the Sea of Galilee, one of the things you can learn just geographically is that during the time of Jesus, and this is a few people that you may know that are, that were, that are on the Sea of Galilee, some people that you may know in this group, but when you're on the Sea of Galilee, what you figure out pretty quickly is that, that on one side of the sea, uh, you, you have a mostly all-Jewish community. So where was one of the feedings of the 5,000 or of the multitude? It was on this side mostly up in this, probably in this area here. But on the other side, it's mostly Gentile. You're, on, you're, on, you're in the Decapolis region during the time of Jesus. This was mostly all Gentile. Where did Jesus cast out the demons? Where did he cast them into? What animal did he cast them into? You might remember. What animal? 
and swine, pigs. You find a lot of pigs in Jewish communities, right? That's a trick question. <laughs> there are no pigs in Jewish communities. We know that that was a Gentile community. Why? There's pigs. Um, and so why would Jesus feed the multitudes on both sides? Because one was a side predominantly Jewish, the other side was a, was, was a predominantly Gentile region. What does that mean? That means that Jesus cared about all nations, all people, and he wanted his word, he wanted that message to be spread everywhere. Um, and so, again, what passes right along the Sea of Galilee? The Via Maris. And there, one of the places of importance is Capernaum. Uh, again, the Decapolis cities, again, we probably refer to those, those are Roman cities. There's only one Roman city that's on the western side of the Jordan River. Um, it's, a, it's one of the a beautiful cities that's the remains are beautiful. It's called Scatopolis or Bet Shin. Um, and just a couple of places here. So where did Jesus spend a lot of his time? He's going to spend 12 months approximately in, in and around Jerusalem. He's going to spend 14 months in Galilee. And he's going to spend six months in other places, including Gentile predominantly areas. So again, it gives you an idea of where we're at. Uh, this is a, an image likely of what Capernaum looked like in the first century. It was a city where there were tax collectors. Uh, and so that's very important. So in, in, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 16, we find this very interesting verse. And, and it's one of those verses that in, in, unless you have a sense of an idea of where these places were, um, if you look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 16, it says, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light and for those dwelling in the region and the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. So where is this a quote from? Well, this is a quote from Isaiah. And Isaiah is speaking to a couple of, of tribes where this great light was going to come from. And this light, of course, is referring to the Messiah. It's referring to Jesus and so what two tribes was he referring to? Well, this is Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 to 2. In the early time, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali were lifted up. But in later time, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, the Galilee of the Gentiles was weighed down. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. What great light was going to come from this area of Zebulun and Naphtali? Where is that? It's right here where Jesus would come from. And so understanding that little tiny reference and understanding again where it's quoted from helps you understand where these nations were, Naphtali, Zebulon, this is where Nazareth is, this is where Capernaum was, where he would make his home. So geography awareness helps us to think missionally as well. Uh, and again, I think it's very important to think about Jesus' mission and it's helpful also to understand our redemption and that process where Jesus came to earth and where, where someone that was, where a God that was not bound by time became confined by time and, gave, and, came, and became confined by earth itself um, and, and brought redemption to us. But before that, God redeemed his people out of, out of Egypt. And folks, that... If you read the account of the book of Exodus, it refers to many names. It refers to Goshen. It refers to Sokoth. It refers to several names along the way. Kadesh Barnea. It refers to Midian, the land of Midian. Why do you have those references? Because they're important. Because it's for us to realize that these are real things, real places, real people. And just like it was real for the children of Israel as they were wandering around the desert, it's real for us. We're walking through our own desert. We're looking for a redemption, and we need to be saved. No difference. So these places, these, this traveling, these places, many of which we're able to go to now. Uh, Kim and I were in Mount Sinai. Uh, there were several that were there. We were, we were literally at Mount Sinai where the law was given. You can walk to these places. You can see them. Uh, you can, again, even go to the place where likely Goshen was. Um, so again, when you think about Mount Moriah, when you think about the importance of Zion, what is those, when you read, when we, when we read we're marching to Zion, what does that really mean? Well, that's referring, of course, to God's appointed place, 
which for, again, for some time was the city of Jerusalem because that's where the temple would be built. Where would the temple be built? It would be built on Mount Moriah where Abraham Abraham took Isaac to sacrifice him was going to be the place where God appointed Solomon to build the temple. So when you see the temple, you see that gold dome on there these days, that's the place where Abraham went and sacrificed or attempted to sacrifice his son. Um, And so, you know, Mount Moriah was the spot. It was the threshing floor. It became a threshing floor during the time of David. David buys that threshing floor in preparation for that being the place where the temple would be built. And here we see this beautiful picture of Jerusalem with the gold dome. This is the Temple Mount. And then right up overlooking it is the Mount of Olives. How many times is there a reference to the Mount of Olives in the New Testament? Many times. And the Mount of Olives is very important for a lot of reasons. At the base of the Mount of Olives is, is of course, Gethsemane. Gethsemane is just literally, you see the trees here in the background. You see, the, the, of course, the grave markers, the tombs. Mount, Mount of Olives is here. Gethsemane is right here. Uh, these places are real. These places, again, again, tie us in to the reality of the events that took place. And finally, geography shapes our view of the crucified and resurrected God. And, and, and when we think of Nazareth, where it all started, Jesus left his childhood home, and this is what it, that, that, that looks like. Remember, Nazareth sits upon this massive ridge that's well above sea level, probably 1,000 feet above sea level. And this is Jesus' view as a child, looking out over the plains. This is the Jezreel Valley. That's Mount Geboa. Mount Moray is over here, and that's Mount Tabor right there, where Deborah and Barak led their armies. So think about Jesus and his childhood looking out and seeing all those sights and remembering the events that took place. Uh, he, he was raised there. He was emptied there. Uh, this is Mount Tabor. Uh, this is my son playing off the cliff, although that's, that's not, of course, uh, that's, that, that looks like it's dangerous, but it's really not. Um, and when you think about Jesus appearing uh, with, during the transfiguration with, with Moses and Elijah, it really connects so much. It connects the northern part of Israel where Elijah confronted the gods of Baal on Mount Carmel. And then, of course, you have Moses connecting the nation of Egypt. And then you have Jesus bringing it all together. So you have this, this beautiful picture of these three people. And I always ask people when we talk about this topic, what was their topic of conversation? What did those three talk about? Um, well, Luke chapter 9 tells us what they talked about. They spoke about his departure, which he was about ready to fulfill at Jerusalem. What is that departure? That word means one thing. That Greek word means exodus. They were talking about Jesus' exodus. And, And of course, just like Moses led the children of Israel out of slavery, Jesus is going to lead us out of slavery and to redeem us. And so lots of pictures, lots of places. This is Mount Hermon where that event likely took place. in The very, very northern parts of Israel today. Uh, and of course, when we think about the place where Jesus was, was, was killed, this is the Temple Mount. Golgotha was outside the city walls, which are highlighted here. And again, you can visit those places today. So what's important for us? God's presence with you has changed just like those places haven't changed. When you go to Israel, you guess what you see? You see the Mount of Olives, you see the Kidron Valley, those places haven't changed, and God's presence with us hasn't changed. His presence and protection are like immovable mountains, and we're so blessed. I'm going to close with Psalms chapter 125, verse 1. It says, those who trust in the Lord are as Mount Zion. They would sing over and over, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. I hope this lesson has been encouraging to you. And I hope that you can see that we too, just like the children of Israel so many thousands of years ago, need say, we need salvation, we need to be redeemed, and there's only one person who can do that, and that's the blood of the Lamb. The same blood that protected the children of Israel, put on the doorpost, there's a blood that was shed for us that saves us and redeems us. If you need that blood, if you need the prayers of this congregation, if you need, if you need to be united with Christ himself, now's the time. Come as we stand and as we sing.